Mother Nature is more powerful than any man-made bomb. More ferocious and destructive than any army. Every day, she claims more victims, showing no mercy and taking no prisoners. Fire's coming this way, Chris, and it's moving. I'm Chris Terrell. As a filmmaker and adventurer, I'm fascinated by extreme situations. I never use a film crew. I prefer to go it alone, just me and my camera. And now I want to confront nature head on, take my camera into her very jaws. Out in a hailstorm now like you have never seen. The thing coming down at 100 miles an hour. Now that hurts. Ah! I want to meet the people who live in the path of killer natural forces. Oh, my God! Who choose to play Russian roulette with nature at her most trigger-happy. It can be beautiful one minute and then kill you the next. Just don't think it can't happen to you because it can. Tonight, I seek out possibly the most violent, destructive and deadly of all storms. The hurricane. You should never have to face a storm alone. Go to allstate.com right now for your own hurricane preparation guide. It will give you several last-minute tips to help you feel better prepared, like three-quarter plywood for reinforcing your windows and doors. Or I suppose if I'm honest, I'd have to admit that I am a bit of an adrenaline junkie. There are those that think I've got a death wish, but I haven't. I'm as terrified as anybody else of what storms can actually do. But I'm also fascinated, beguiled by these extraordinary forces of nature. That's why I want to get as close as I can to them, look them in the eye, feel their heartbeat, really try and understand them from the inside. Maybe that's why right now I'm traveling down a completely deserted interstate towards Louisiana, with all the traffic going in the opposite direction. Tomorrow at dawn, a gigantic hurricane named Gustav is expected to make landfall on the US Gulf Coast. Fearing a repeat of the infamous Hurricane Katrina that claimed 2,000 lives, the mayor of New Orleans is describing Gustav as the mother of all storms and has ordered a mass evacuation. Wow, 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 wow. I've never seen anything like it. Never-ending stream of coaches full of evacuees. They're all coming in the direction that I'm going in. Slightly disconcerting, I have to say. Only time will tell now just what Gustav has in store for Louisiana, or indeed Texas. Or indeed me. Jesus is come. He says, come on in, find peace and shout. Hide away until these calamities be overpassed. This is the middle of an incredibly active hurricane season. Crossing the Atlantic from Africa, they've been stacking up, ready to smash into the US's southern coastline. All hurricanes are named, and Gustav is just the next in line to strike, probably around Lafayette in Louisiana, exactly where I'm headed for. I still have a few hours to prepare for his arrival at daybreak. Well, hurricanes are notoriously difficult to predict and uh, even more difficult to film. Uh, flying debris, water, wind, the lot gets hurled at you. And it's an absolute nightmare, waterproofing cameras. But to be honest, I've taken these, some of these cameras into some pretty extreme places in my time. And I've found that, never mind all the expensive stuff, one of the best ways of waterproofing is a black bin liner. And the camera well wrapped up for one of these. Um, you can't do much better, to be honest. And as for me, my trusty ski helmet and goggles. Um, this for the old bonts and this for the eyes. 100 mile an hour winds plus can do a lot of damage. Uh, but no matter how well protected I am um, or how well protected my cameras are, it's all going to count for nothing if I can't get into the storm in the first place. So that's, that's number one mission. So we'll just hope for the best. 
It's now morning and the weather has seriously deteriorated. Gustav has made landfall just east of here and is heading this way. Although he could change direction at any time. Everybody in, all of To have a chance of getting right into Gustav's path, I've hooked up with a bunch of homegrown hurricane chasers. So where are we? I keep losing where we are. I know. We're headed southeast. We're in this uh, outer rain band here. Michael and his fellow chasers have all the sophisticated gizmos to put me into the violent heart of a hurricane. But their plan is far from sophisticated. They're going to drive smack bang into the thing. You know, after 25, 30 years of doing it, you start realizing, you know, where, where, what you can do, what you can't do. And, um, you know, it's, it's just awesome to see, you know, nature's display in such a, you know, vivid way. Hopefully we won't lose any windows, because that's, got, that's a real nuisance. After about 20 minutes, we reach the outer bands of Hurricane Gustav. Driving is getting perilous, so Jim decides it's time to pull in and hunker down in the lee of a building. Might be the best place we got right now. They plan to watch the storm unfold from the relative safety of the car, but I've decided to venture out. I want a sense of what a hurricane is like face to face. And it's walking down completely deserted High Street. The really is blowing up now. Here comes, here comes a really high wind now. The lion of those has been blown away. The strength of the wind is such I can't stand up. It's just like Gustavus boxing. Right hook. Left hook. Ah. Ah. On the hurricane scale of one to five, these 100 mile per hour winds are only a category two, but they're already causing a lot of damage. Walls are coming down, the roof has been torn off. Ah, there it comes again! Suddenly, in this ghost town, I catch sight of a solitary figure darting in and out of a house. Not everyone, it seems, has evacuated. Oh. You're brave people! <laughs> <laughs> Was it you I saw out there? It looked like you were having such a wonderful time. Did you get a thrill out of it? She's the crazy one. Yeah, I like doing stuff like this. Yes, a lot. Yes. It's just like a ghost town out there. Yep. Everybody yeah, almost everybody left around here. We never leave them. We always stay. So what's it been like here? Zoe? <laughs> Been a rough. Hey, We've been watching the trees fall and uh, power lines fall. A lot of wind, a lot of rain. But you're all sticking yeah, together. Sticking together. We're family, man. We gotta stick together. That's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bye everybody. Good luck. You're listening to continuing uh, hurricane coverage, aftermath of Gustav, on 102.1 KQISFM. It is 11 o'clock, lots of information kind of coming in. Uh, we, we know that uh, some big trees were overturned, some branches are down, and uh, they are in the process of assessing damage right now. Gustav has passed over us and moved inland where he'll slowly die. It's suddenly spookily calm. Everyone and everything is in a state of bewilderment. Damage is widespread. The emergency services hemmed in by the storm were too late to save the young man in this house. In all, 
10 people in Louisiana were killed by Gustave. But this was nothing like the number of fatalities that had been feared. Here's what's going on right now. Right. Um, upper and lower St. Martin Parish. We got a mess, but relatively speaking, you don't have a big mess. So, Parish, kind of a... Gustave, in the end, for all his sound and fury, was not the mother of all storms as had been billed. Louisiana, it would seem, has dodged a bullet, and the hundreds of thousands of people that evacuated are now coming flooding back. And the trouble is, many of them will now feel that the authorities who called for a mandatory evacuation uh, had made a bad call, but they cried wolf. And this begs the question, next time a hurricane threatens this area, will these people evacuate or will they stay put? Well, in fact, we're about to find out, because a second hurricane is following in close behind Gustav. His name is Ike and is looking like an absolute monster. Having had my first taste of Hurricane Gustav in Louisiana, I'm now just days later in hot pursuit of Hurricane Ike, which is fast heading for America's sunshine state, Florida. It's hard to believe, looking out at the clouds, that somewhere out there, a huge storm is brewing. All hurricanes begin life above the warm waters of the tropical Atlantic. Rapidly rising moist air feeds storm clouds which, helped by the Earth's rotation, generate a swirling mass of rain and wind. These circulate at up to 200 miles per hour around a central eye which, contrary to popular belief, is almost completely calm. These donut-shaped storms are so huge they can only be seen in their monstrous entirety from space. This is Hurricane Ike. He's already killed 70 people in Haiti and has now got his sights set on Cuba. I'm heading for Key West, Florida's southernmost tip, just 100 miles north of Cuba. And there's every expectation that Ike could veer north and hit the Keys head on. Again, the Keys are still under hurricane watch south of Ocean Reef. Keep listening as we bring you the latest updates. This time, my aim is to be in place as the hurricane comes off the sea to hit land. Always the most destructive point of impact. Still a bright and beautiful day. Breezy, uh, nothing more than breezy, but certainly this is an indication that things are beginning to hot up slowly. Uh, Ike is just around the corner, really, um, and will impact here probably later tonight. All the tourists have been told by the authorities to get out of town immediately. They've obeyed without question. They've come for the sunshine, not a full-blown hurricane. But I'm amazed to discover that most of the locals are planning to ride the storm, completely ignoring the mandatory evacuation. You guys live here? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so you're not evacuating? No, hell no. <laughs> we got a good stock of beer. Yeah. Beer, whiskey, <laughs> rum, yeah. vodka and a watermelon. What else do you need? <laughs> well, this attitude may seem a little cavalier, but Key West has often been saved from a hurricane's killer force by the Caribbean islands that take the full brunt. Whatever the reason, Key Westians strike me as natural optimists. In fact, today, there is a palpable sense of gay abandon. We're going to have a little uh, party tonight. You're going to have a, have a hurricane party? Yes, <laughs> hurricane <laughs> party today. You know what? World famous drag show still going to perform tonight. But you didn't think about moving out? No, we're a bit for this before. Yeah. going to make sure we're going to have fun until the storm hits. When the storm hits, we're all hunkered down. But until then, we're having a party. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> <West. laughs> it's a beautiful day, so let's have some fun down the gate. We're going to have a great time, be safe. The only American Caribbean island where gay is OK. Have some fun. Well, this is one way to celebrate a hurricane coming in. Showtime, showtime, showtime. Straight defiance, gay defiance. Key West is putting a collective two fingers up at Ike. But at the bottom of Main Street, there are ominous signs.
minute by minute, you can see that the storm surge in the sea is increasing. Um, and the, the sea is now impinging on the breakwaters um, and actually coming over into the road into Key West. The people here, however, remain defiant. Hurricane parties are the order of the day. Bravado? Well, Dutch courage, certainly. Can I ask you what oh. you're doing, Madam, for the hurricane? What am I doing for the hurricane? Here I am. I'm drinking wine for the hurricane. Are you kidding? <laughs> Do you want to come with us? Where are you going? Up there. I think they're slightly tanked up. I would suspect they're slightly tanked up, but maybe that's the way you've got to be for a hurricane. Not so much tanked up as made up is Shirley, who actually prefers hurricanes to the tornadoes she grew up with. What is <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest. You know, tornadoes come, 15 minutes, you have like very little warning, and at least here, you know, you know what's going on, and you're either brave or not, so, you know, and I'm brave. Look at me, hello. <laughs> so, is Ike heading this way? There's no way of knowing. But the weather is rapidly deteriorating, and as all hotels have been closed until the threat of Ike passes, I've settled down for a fitful night's sleep in the car and wait to see what morning brings. At daybreak, we discover that Ike, rather than smashing us head on, has continued west. What we're feeling is just his outer fringe, but it's still a mighty tropical storm. Now, normal people would still take shelter. But Key Westians, as I've already found out, are far from normal. Are you all crazy in Key West? Are you all crazy in Key West? Mostly, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Standing right in the middle of a tropical storm. Winds are about 60, 70 miles an hour. And hurling the sea on the coast. This is Ike at his weakest. I hate to think what he'd be like at his strongest, where he can really flex his muscles. And he's now powering up. He's going across the Gulf of Mexico, ready to strike at anywhere along that coast in about three or four days' time. And I hate to imagine what sort of damage he could do there. But I'm determined to get to the point where Ike will make his next landfall. The question is, where exactly will that be? What we do know is that Ike is heading west across the massive Gulf of Mexico. But hurricanes are difficult to second guess. So, to try and get into his mind, I'm heading to the US Air Force Base at Biloxi, Mississippi. These people have ways of getting into hurricanes, literally. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be taking off this plane behind me. Some of the famous hurricane hunters of the United States Air Force. And we're going to fly not just over Hurricane Ike, but actually into Hurricane Ike, right into the very eye of the storm. Today's mission is to try and predict Ike's next move, to find out exactly where and how hard he'll strike. Yes, sir, just to confirm, our altitude clearance now is flight level 100. In no time at all, we're over the Gulf of Mexico and in the monstrous presence of Ike himself. Below us now is Hurricane Ike. That is Hurricane Ike. Enormous as he is. This is a massive eye wall. Eventually we'll get over it and the eye Even at 10,000 feet, we can't see Ike in his entirety. He actually fills the whole of the Gulf of Mexico, 2,000 miles in circumference and 600 miles in diameter. 
To build a more intimate picture of Ike, songs or probes are dropped deep into his body. These measure wind speed and direction, temperature, pressure and humidity. It's like measuring the heartbeat and pulse of the monster to see just how strong he is. Be ready for rapid fire, okay? I'm consistent wind speed going up now. It's 78 knots. Okay. 85. And it just keeps climbing. Okay. Might start getting a little bumpy here coming in here. As long as the pilot flies with the winds, we'll be okay. Traveling at 350 miles an hour, he can outrun the fastest hurricane winds. But if he were to fly across them, even this solid old prop plane would be ripped apart in seconds. Somebody sneak over, like one degree turn to the left. They would matter too much. The winds are saying we need to go about 50 degrees to the left, but... As we peer down into the calm eye of this monstrous storm, information from the probes make one thing very clear. Ike is wounded. The mountains of Cuba have ripped a hole in him, sapping his energy. But, like all injured beasts, it doesn't mean to say he's no longer dangerous. It doesn't appear to be as organized as we expected it to be, but it's, it's still a force to be reckoned with. And it's got plenty of time between here and its predicted landfall somewhere in Texas. It's got plenty of time over nice warm water to, to develop if it decides to. Feeding voraciously off the warm, energy-giving waters of the Mexican Gulf, Ike must inevitably strengthen before he reaches land. Determined to outrun him, I drive through the night towards Texas, the state now bracing itself for Ike's impact. Lord, I pray tonight for all of those in the Louisiana, Texas, Gulf Coast area who are facing the wrath of Hurricane Ike. Pray, Lord, that you would grant wisdom in what to do, whether to leave or to stay. And I would pray tonight for all of these folks who are traveling on the roads as well. Hurricane Ike is well on its way now and everybody is in total panic. Galveston, on the coast, uh, they're saying could be underwater by this time tomorrow, underwater. <laughs> and they are also saying that death is an inevitability. Um, so this is a very, very serious hurricane. This isn't, this isn't time for playing games like they did in Key West. This, this really is, we are being told, a life and death situation. Nevertheless, I need to get myself into the best possible position to film Ike head on. To minimize the risk, I've hooked up with a couple of British storm chasers. There's a lot, there's a lot more um, instability now in the, uh, in the cloud structure. Well, you know, don't... Uh... Stuart you know, is an amateur wild weather stuff. enthusiast, but it's a very the, experienced it's chaser. bearing in mind. Um, what we're going to do is drive to a place called Freeport. We're then probably going to push up to Galveston, and we're going to set up there, so we're in the path, we're in the track of it. So. I can tell you now, if we're sitting in the car and we get 110 mile an hour gust, it will be white knuckle, absolute white knuckle. It appears Ike is heading straight for the town of Galveston. Built on a coastal spit, it will be incredibly vulnerable. But that's exactly where we intend to dig in. But on our way there, we pass through the small town of Freeport and are shot at what we find. Whoa, 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 whoa. That is amazing. It's still hours, hours before Ike actually arrives here, but already the storm surge, the, the, the wall of water being pushed ahead of the hurricane on the way in is already flooding this whole place. I'm actually shocked by how far inland the water's already come, and we need to be careful here that we don't get stuck where we are. It's, uh, it's annoying because we needed to take that road to get to Galveston Island. We can't, Galveston's over there, we can't get there. We're going to have to drive back inland and round. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. The storm surge is coming in fast and furiously. Nothing is going to hold those waters back. Absolutely nothing. A hurricane storm surge can increase normal tides by 15 feet or more. 
For the Gulf Coast communities that are on average only 10 feet above sea level, this spells real danger. Nine out of 10 fatalities in a hurricane are caused by drowning. We've got people down here that are, are stuck in the middle of the roadway trying to drive out. They can't make their, their vehicles are stalled out because they waited this morning to leave. We got another family, an elderly couple in the back here that they don't want to leave. They want to stay there with their house. They are not using their intelligence. They're, they're emotional about the property and their houses. Sure. So what can you do about that? Can you make them leave? No, there's no way to make a person leave their house. This is not nothing compared to what's coming. I mean, we've got high winds coming. We've got higher water coming. Uh, the, the tide is already coming over Beach Drive. Uh, so this is nothing to, what's, to expect what's coming in the future. The wording from the National Weather Service is stark. Basically, they say if you're down on the coast, you will die. You will face certain death. Now, I'm used to stern words from the National Weather Service. It doesn't put me off as a storm chaser, but that's really focused my mind today. They say the road down here is getting impassable. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, so we may have to get everybody down. If we don't move fast, we're going to be stuck here. Yeah. Well, this, it, this has come up since I've been here. Oh, it's coming up by the inch when I was standing in it. God knows what those police are going to do about the people they've got still in those houses. I just, uh, they cannot understand what is about to hit them. I think they've, uh, they've grossly underestimated the damage that this water is going to cause. I think, you know, it's a massive storm. Oh, God, we're blocked off. Hang on. We can't get through. Hold on, can we go around here? No, gate shut. That's all right, we'll have to go back and factor a new route. I'll just work us around it. Yeah, take that one and we'll probably go up and come back round. Hang on, guys. Luckily, we find the one remaining road to Galveston that's not underwater. The model forecast tracks is going to take the eye of the hurricane dead centre over this bit here. Um, it's not very high above sea water, as we can see and it's whether or not there's anything that will provide us protection. But I tell you now, if I can find a multi-storey car park and get the car up one or two layers, then I'll game on. Very tough and very interesting intercept, this will be. Galveston is no stranger to big storms. In 1900, it was hit by a massive hurricane that to this day remains America's deadliest ever natural disaster. Over 8,000 people were killed when 15-foot storm tides swamped the whole island. But history is quickly forgotten. Are you, are you guys staying here? Yeah, we're staying here. You know there's a hurricane coming? Right. You don't mind? We know, we know. We know about it. We're storm chasing. I'm a B.O.I. I'm You're a steward. <laughs> OK. Where are you going to hide out? I'm, I'm staying at a place over here on Avenue R. OK. It's a well-built house. Old one. OK, look after yourself. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. OK, bye. Maybe modern Galvestonians have confidence in this 17-foot seawall, which to date has held surging seas at bay. Oh, oh my word! <laughs> Look at that, it's boiling! <laughs> Just coming. Oh, yeah. see you, me. You can see behind me, this is Galveston. And this is likely to be right in the path of Hurricane Ike when he arrives. And already the surge, I need hardly say anything else. This is the sea surge. On a normal day, people would be sunbathing on a beach just below this sea wall. The circle that you can see in the middle is actually the eye of Hurricane Ike. The black, the black circle, yeah. That's black circle, you can see it's spinning around, spinning around. The red line is the projected path, and as you can see, we're sitting right on the projected path on the, on the coastline. We're going to get absolutely walloped here, actually. Absolutely whacked. There is nowhere on this planet I'd rather be right now. Um, I'm really very, very excited of, uh, of what this evening will bring. Yeah. It's uh, quite incredible. <laughs> Ten days ago, when I intercepted Hurricane Gustav, billed as the storm of the century, virtually everyone had evacuated, even though the storm failed to live up to predictions. Now his brother Ike's arriving, and despite a mandatory evacuation, a third of the residents, that's 20,000 people, think the Galveston authorities are crying wolf and are sitting tight. 
It's now down to people like Police Sergeant Michael Gray to persuade residents to take Ike seriously and get to the public shelter, called the Shelter of Last Resort, before it's too late. If it hits where they say it's going to hit, it's going to be very nasty. And, well, it looks like some waves have made it over the seawall and dumped a lot of water down here. Where, where are you headed to? Corner. What are you gonna, where are you going to go? Here. You, we're staying. You need to go to the shelter, OK? Oh, no, we're OK. Are you sure? I can yes, sir, we're OK. No, thank you, we're OK. If you need something, call us, OK? Because yes, it's about sir. to get bad. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. From now on, it's going to deteriorate. Can you take us back home? Uh, well, look, y'all need to get inside, OK? And I would recommend getting in your car and right, driving to on. the shelter. Michael hasn't got long to try and get people to the shelter. After dark, he and all emergency services will be withdrawn from the streets for their own safety. But conditions are deteriorating so fast that residents are soon reconsidering their options. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is, there, is there somewhere we could go? Like a shelter? Yeah, we have, we have a shelter uh, of last resort. I can't hear you. Yeah, we, we do have a shelter of last resort. Do you need a ride there? Yeah, because uh, it's flooding everywhere, man. It's OK. Bad. Come here and hop in the back over here. Uh, so you, you, you live here? Yeah. You get like, get like, I've been here for like 17 years now. 17 years? Have you never seen anything like this? Not like this. I didn't think that until I started feeling the winds and I seen the water. Then the water started coming in. So that tells me right there is hey, that's just, this is just the beginning. So I told myself, I said, you know what, I gotta get out of here. I don't think I'll be able to make it. Uh, yeah, we'll make it. Think positive. Hi. What time does everybody have to be off the streets, eight? Eight o'clock. The sea surge, increasing by the minute, is threatening all coastal buildings and structures. The Balinese room, built on sturdy wooden struts, is one of Galveston's most famous landmarks, a venue to such greats as Bob Hope and Frank Sinatra. For 75 years, it's weathered every storm thrown at it. Though now, some of the supporting crossbeams are already working loose. As the light begins to fade, Michael drops off the frightened but grateful hurricane refugee at the shelter of last resort. Meanwhile, the sense of threat increases. Precious few roads are now passable. Ike's a big boy. Oh, now we're starting to get more rain. An hour later, it's Michael's last chance to help anyone seeking shelter. He's already been called in to take his own refuge. If you call for a ride, come out to the road and meet us at the intersection of 19th and Broadway. We'll give you a ride. If you called for a ride, come out. This is the time right now when uh, those who didn't, who didn't heed the mandatory evacuation that was called, this is the time that if they are able to get through to us, we're going to have to tell them that, you know, we can't, we can't go out. We're running from the water right now. Oh, that's good. Michael and the rest of the emergency services hunker down for the night in the strongest hotel on the island. I, on the other hand, am joining Stuart on the second floor of a multi-story car park that's already taking on a lot of water. We're right on the very edge of the eye wall. Where are we? We're actually here, this white dot here. What the hell's going off out there? What, 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 what's the situation? Well, the situation is that the eye is now approaching us. It's less than an hour offshore. And of course, the strongest, strongest winds in a hurricane are always found around the periphery of the eye wall. You'll hear a lot of debris flying through the egg, shards of wood, bits of glass, broken bricks, and they're, they're literally lethal. They'll, they'll cut you in half if they uh, hit you. The next hour to an hour and a half are going to become very, very hairy. There is no way you can go out on those. It'll be lethal out on those streets. Absolutely lethal. Despite Stuart's chilling warning, I decide to go out anyway. I haven't chased Ike all over America, 
to hide from him in a car park. The question is, will my camera stand up to the challenge? And will I? You can see the wind coming in. One, one way, well first one way and then the other. Knocking, in, knocking me off my feet. It's all I can do is to shout against this incredible wind. The winds are now well over 100 miles per hour and the roar is deafening. This rain and spray at his strongest, Ike is like nothing I've ever experienced. It's terrifying and thrilling all at the same time. Despite all the expectation, I can never even imagine like this. It's quite, quite breathtaking. Fighting not to be hurled into a murderous sea, I take immediate advantage of a dip in the roaring wind and make for the sanctuary of the car park. Guided in by Stuart, worried for my safety. Not long afterwards, Stuart notices a change in the wind conditions. It looks like the eye is approaching us. We've, uh, we've not had any really significant gusts now for a couple of minutes. It's just noticeable. It's still very windy and very, you would call it gale force, but it hasn't got that raw energy. And it's almost becoming more quiet. I'll take you another, another 10 minutes and you'll, we'll be outside walking around. You wouldn't even need an umbrella. Stuart was right. Just minutes after being blasted by the first eye wall of Hurricane Ike, I am, for a while, safe in the surreal calm of the storm's eye. Well, that was some experience, and we are now in the eye of the storm. The winds uh, died down, the rain stopped, that roar has ceased, so we just got a little bit of respite gather ourselves and prepare ourselves uh, for um, the whole thing all over again. Sure enough, the second eye wall soon explodes upon us, even more powerfully than the first. Once again, I cannot resist the lure of being part of this extraordinary force of nature. Winds 100 miles per hour plus. Ike is smashing up the place. He's smashing me. Surely there's going to be massive destruction, and loss of life here in Galveston must now be a certainty. The incredible experience of meeting Ike face to face couldn't have prepared me for what I find this morning.
everywhere you go. It's just destruction. The devastation is everywhere. Flooding, wind damage, and of course power lines are down as well, which has led to short circuits and all sorts of electrical problems and fires like this one behind me now. Man! The house survives a hurricane okay and a fire. The firefighters can only stand and watch. With water mains ruptured, there is nothing to fight fires with. And down on the coast, I find, well, nothing. Last night, I was filming some of the restaurants built out on the piers, wooden piers going out to sea. Well, they didn't make it. They now look like this. These splintered timbers are all that's left of the famous Balinese rooms, where Sinatra used to sing. I'm the manager of the Balinese room. I'm, I'm really hurt right now. See all those debris, then I see those holes right there. Yeah. That used to be a part of the ballroom. It, it's really hurt. It's painful. This is incredible. You know, these buildings over there, they were here for six, 75 years. Gone. Look at here. Makes you feel real sad. Did you expect this to happen? No. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I'm 54 years old. I've never been anything through this. But we made it. This other big problem now will be uh, looters as well. Uh, the shops are smashed apart, smashed open. And also now the National Guard are out to come in by helicopter. Nobody's leaving anything to chance anymore in Galveston. Not the day after Hurricane Ike. Ike's huge storm surge and screaming winds have left virtually nothing untouched or intact. Cars are in the sea and boats are on land. Even by Stuart standards, this level of chaos and destruction is shocking. I enjoy seeing the weather and I enjoy the, the aspects of the hurricane, but it's the aftermath. When, when you're faced with this and you realise that, you know, that's, that's someone's boat and they've probably worked all their life to be able to afford it and it's their dream and here it is lying smashed on an interstate and it, it's everywhere you turn, you know, it's awful. I, I get no pleasure, no pleasure from seeing this. Galveston is shell-shocked. Nobody can quite believe what's happened. We went to sleep, we woke up and, and stepped out into water up over our bed. Wow. I was praying all night long, and I woke up thanking the good Lord I was still alive. Who's this little guy? Oh, boy. I found him stranded in, un, underneath there. Underneath the porch. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. That's one that got lucky. Yeah. A lot of them died. Yeah. Hey, tell him what you named him. Ike. <laughs> <laughs> Galveston will bounce back. Galveston was destroyed in 1900, pretty much, and uh, it bounced back. It'll bounce back. Uh, Galvestonians, they're very resilient. Ike's impact was felt right across Texas, where he was to prove the third costliest hurricane ever, causing $13 billion worth of damage. Two million people were to be without power for weeks. Ike led to the biggest rescue effort in Texan history. But miraculously, only 12 people were killed in Galveston, out of a total of 103 deaths across the southern states of America and the Caribbean. 34 are still missing, 19 of them from Galveston. Next time, I seek out the elusive but deadly firestorm and find a living hell on Earth.
Mother Nature is more powerful than any man-made bomb. More ferocious and destructive than any army. Every day, she claims more victims, showing no mercy and taking no prisoners. Fire's coming this way, Chris, and it's moving. I'm Chris Terrell. As a filmmaker and adventurer, I'm fascinated by extreme situations. I never use a film crew. I prefer to go it alone, just me and my camera. And now I want to confront nature head on, take my camera into her very jaws. Out in a hailstorm like you have never seen. The thing coming down at 100 miles an hour. Now that hurts. Ah! I want to meet the people who live in the path of killer natural forces. Oh, my God! Who choose to play Russian roulette with nature at her most trigger-happy. It can be beautiful one minute and then kill you the next. Just don't think it can't happen to you because it can. We're just hanging on to their life here. This time, I seek out the most vicious and unpredictable of nature's furies. The tornado. Well, people who've experienced tornadoes often say it's like a freight train passing. Well, I've never experienced a tornado, so I don't know what it actually feels like. But this is what a freight train passing feels like. because French French are only a few yards wide, going no more than 60 or 70 miles an hour. Tornadoes can be up to two miles wide and going at up to 300 miles an hour. If you want to find out what a real tornado is like, Tornado Alley in America is the place to go. Nearly 10 times the size of England, this vast rural area stretches all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to the Canadian border. This is Wizard of Oz country, the worst place in the world for tornadoes. Or the best if you're part of the storm chasing community. Tornado watch until 7, cloudy, numerous showers and thunderstorms. Right. First severe thunderstorm rain. warning of the day. Tornadoes come with lightning, thunder, and killer hail. Chasing them is now very high tech, but not for the faint hearted. Roger, have tornadoes got personalities? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> They're a living, breathing, thinking creature, in my opinion. Yeah, that's the way I've always looked at them. They'll do whatever they can to survive, and they'll run you over. So they don't care who you are. England would be a bit of a nightmare if we tried chasing. So this is like very frantic. Lorraine, a secretary from Bromley in Kent, has spent every holiday for the last seven years storm chasing. When I first came over here, we went into one garage and I made the mistake of saying a tornado was coming to these people in this garage and they started, yeah, right, they started freaking out. And, but I, I was uh, less knowledgeable then. <laughs> I've learned to keep my mouth shut since. <laughs> So it is a, it's a real community at the moment. Everybody after the same thing. Just a glimpse of that all elusive tornado, close up and personal. I'm a computer engineer by trade. Okay. They've got Voltex, and we're, right. we're tr triangulating. Oh, so we're, cool. we're if they're not busy actually chasing, they like nothing better than to talk shop, basically. I just, uh, I just wish to God I knew what the hell they were talking about. For the storm chasers, Tornado Alley is a massive adventure playground. But to get a feel for what it's like to live in a place like this, I decided to visit a small community on the Kansas Plains. This is Greensburg. Back in 2007, it was like hundreds of other Midwestern towns. But all that changed when it was hit by one of America's biggest ever tornadoes. There's a tornado right in front of us, guys. Funnel cloud, less than a half a mile away. Wow. Wow, look at that. That's a stovepipe. Man, that's beautiful. 
At nine that night, storm chasers saw a giant tornado hit the ground 20 miles southwest of Greensburg. Oh shit, power flash is over here. Oh my God, that is a huge wedge. Oh my God. That is a huge wedge. Look at that. God. Oh my God. Oh my God. This tornado rapidly grew to nearly two miles oh. wide. It was now careering straight for Greensburg. Damn, it's huge! That is a big, big tornado. It's huge. It's huge. Oh my god, major, major damage. Twenty minutes before the tornado hit Greensburg, its warning sirens rang out. I didn't really think much about it because they always go off at like night. And then Danny came in and he's like, I think this is going to be the big one. I was like, oh, okay, shh. You know, I told him be quiet because we were watching the movie. Selena didn't have a basement, so she huddled on the floor of the shower room with husband Danny and 10-year-old daughter Mariah. Bedroom wall was on the north side. All of a sudden, it just blew away. And then the wires in the bathroom um, was snapping and popping and sparking and stuff. That's about the last I knew. The tornado, spinning at nearly 300 miles per hour, ripped the house from around them, and all three went flying through the air. Can you remember being lifted up by the wind? Yeah. Let's describe what that was like. It, like, it was almost like a roller coaster, like when you go too, like way too fast, and you almost want to get sick, and it's one of those roller coasters where you just want to get, get off because it's way too extreme for your body. But... Like, I know it was only seconds that we were up in the air, but it seemed like forever. They were finally dumped 150 yards away from the house. Miraculously, Mariah landed on her feet, but her mother wasn't so lucky. She was covered in a lot of debris, and I tried to uncover her, but um, her bathroom floor was on top of her, so I couldn't get that off of her. Oh, my God. That's horrible. <laughs> Ninety-five percent of Greensburg had been flattened. It was just a terrible feeling to walk out of the house and seeing the devastation. One of the things that, that continues to keep in my mind is we're standing in a, a grocery store parking lot and everybody had been reduced to the same level. No economic status, nobody better than anybody else. We were all reduced to our very simple estate, and we only had what was on our body at that particular time. Everyone walking around in a daze wondering what in the world has happened here. I didn't know anything for four days. Um, and when I came to, I was like, oh my gosh, where is Danny? And my family assured me that he was at the other hospital, but he wasn't doing too well. And I just couldn't imagine life without him. Oh, clap of lightning now it makes you kind of nervous. You know, it's a... Danny broke his back and spent months in hospital, but he survived. Eleven others weren't so lucky. A tornado like this is something you know nobody ever wants to go through ever again. One time's enough for anybody. <laughs> You're a lucky man, Danny. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I really am. A year on from the Greensburg disaster, it's the start of a new tornado season. In the Midwest, storms of this magnitude are part of the very culture. Something people from other parts of the world find hard to comprehend. Oh, yes! <laughs> wow! That was a huge, huge, huge fork of lightning. These giant thunderstorms are called supercells. They breed tornadoes. To understand the nature of tornadoes, I'm going to have to get to the heart of these monsters. To do that, I'll have to get up close. Perhaps too close for comfort.
In my quest to understand tornadoes, I've come to Oklahoma to meet up with Dave Ewald, who's been chasing tornadoes since he was 14. One, two, three, four. There's six or seven Brits anyway. There's six or seven of us Brits and, and one Dave, one, one American, one Oklahoma. <laughs> What's this don't follow? <laughs> All the Brits together apart from the mad Oklahoman. Oh, like an honorary Brit? He is an honorary Brit, yeah, because he loves only fools and horses. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that trigger. <laughs> Most storm chasers travel in convoy using walkie-talkies to communicate. <laughs> Sharing data and equipment increases their chances of striking tornado gold. Still have storms coming up from the southwest. And they think they nothing of well. driving hundreds of miles a day in search of their holy grail. Is this about like playing chicken with Mother Nature? There's probably that out there a little bit, but a little slip up can be a fatal slip up. You know what the dangers are and you try to keep yourself out of those dangers as much as possible. If we ever see a mass casualty among storm chasers, it's probably going to be lightning that does it. You're so into storm. Yeah, I think so. Big way. I've had such a lifelong interest that I can't see it waning <laughs> before my final days are up. This is quite morbid, but I'd like to have my ashes scattered into a storm. Into a storm or a tornado? Well, preferably a tornado, although I understand that the logistics of that could be quite complicated. <laughs> And you're serious about that? Yeah, deadly serious. <laughs> <laughs> it looks to be a very, very long, interesting weather afternoon and evening across southwest Kansas. A tornado watch remains in effect until 10 o'clock tonight. Clouds of dust right across the road now. 650 miles and a day later, radar and satellite technology have got us to our first storm. The chase is on. We're coming right around the back of the storm now. There's a lot of chases around, five or six cars are standing there, deciding which way to go. Dave didn't hesitate, straight down this track. Yeah, I like our chances with this one. Looks like it's picking up more and more volume all the time. This vast, ominous cloud is a huge thunderstorm, a classic supercell, a storm chaser's dream. Wow. It's like being underneath in a giant spaceship. Looks looking like any second is going to touch down. But structure-wise and on radar, this is one of the best-looking storms in Kansas right now. It's a nice supercell. The warm prairie air feeds the bottom of the supercell fueling an updraft of vicious circulating winds that invisibly drive the storm. Good rising motion under here, Our state. little tail cloud, it's really standing up pretty Once nice. the supercell gets going, it throws out bands of torrential rain, giant hail, and sometimes, at the back, the sting of a tornado. Actually, we may have a little bit of rotation over here. Hard to tell. Looks like it's rotating, doesn't it? Looks a little bit like it. It's coming, it's coming down. So it's coming down. There you go. <laughs> Every twister is unique. It can touch down from merely a few seconds to several terrifying hours. There it is, there it is. There we go. It's coming down. So it's coming down. <laughs> this one is gone in seconds. But when a supercell produces one tornado, there's likely to be more. So we're back on the chase. It's trying very hard to produce a tornado. In fact, it did momentarily. The fleeting little tornado. But you know, that's a prize. There's a mud here. Oh, God. Stuck. Endeavoring to chase this storm. Got completely stuck in the mud. And extremely dangerous tornado is on the ground. This is a life threatening situation. If you are in the path of this tornado, take cover immediately. There's someone on the road up there for another yeah. possible yeah. tornado. Uh, there's a massive storm coming up from Garden City as well. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up to us. Yeah. Yeah. The radio warns us of other tornadoes in the area, so it's a relief when the local farmer turns up to tow us out. Something bad's happened up there. Yeah. Uh, there's fire trucks and police. We hear that a couple of miles down the road, houses have been hit. 
tornadoes, I'm beginning to realise, are hit and run merchants. Difficult to predict and impossible to pin down. A tornado come through, it done a lot of damage, but nobody's hurt so far. Right. This, this house just behind us here, that's been damaged. Well, it's doing damage, yeah, and they can't get out on account of the power lines here is down. They can't get out of their driveway. What did happen? I was sitting on the couch and I, I went I went back and I started screaming in the bedroom and I went back in there and the whole trailer picked up and flew this way. These people had a lucky escape. Mobile homes, like cars, can be tossed several hundred feet if they're hit by the full force of a tornado. A large and extremely dangerous tornado is on the ground. Heavy rainfall may obscure this tornado. Take cover now. If you wait to see or hear it coming, it may be too late to get to a safe place. In these dark and rainy conditions, it's difficult enough to see the road, let alone a tornado. Oh, God. Anybody discern any motion that... Tornado on the ground to the left. Yes, it's there. In the darkness, right ahead of us. Oh, my God. This is power cables. Fantastic spot, Chris. The only way to see a tornado at night is if it's lit up from above by lightning or from below when it plows into a power cable like this one. We arrive at the motel unscathed. I now understand why most chasers don't continue after dark. Spotters are confirming a large, violent, multiple vortex tornado. If you're in the path of this storm, abandoned mobile homes and vehicles. Dramatic lightning strikes to my left. If possible, move to a basement or a storm shelter. Otherwise, move The to next morning, I'm driving along Interstate 35 near Perry, Oklahoma when the warnings of an imminent tornado send me scurrying for cover. Hold up at that garage. I've been separated from my chaser buddies and their radar feeds, so I feel completely blind. I've been four years in the US. I've been hearing about this for four years. I've never seen a tornado in my life, so. Yeah, go ahead. Because I'm nervous. I'm a... Well, it's still stationary in Enos. How far is that? 20 miles. 20 miles? Yeah. Towards Enos, so that's... Is it coming here? Is it coming right here? I don't know. The mobile is still mobile stationary, but it's a big thing. What's that mean, stationary? It, 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 it stood still. If you're going north or south, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Really? Yeah. So we should just get in the car and go? Well, I guess. That way? Yeah. <laughs> north? OK, thank you. <laughs> All right. I don't know what to do, though. Sorry? Don't know what I'm gonna do once it comes here. So the storm has reached this gas station. A lot of worried people wondering whether to make a run for it or, or stay put. I'm gonna wait here. Well, where are these guys gonna go? <laughs> That's what. Winds are coming down inside of this circulation. Not saying that there's not a tornado, because there likely still is. We're so rain wrapped, there's no way at all of telling whether there's a tornado in amongst all this. It's on the southeast side of Perry and it's tightening up right now. It's about ready to go gate to gate here, which is going to be a vortex coming down. It's very close to that right now. It's tightening up. in the gas station. Oh, my God. Come here, Chad. Uh, no. I 
came out here today to chase tornadoes, to see a tornado, and in this situation right now, along with all these people in here, uh, the last thing I want to see is a tornado up close and personal. I just hope that we are spared today. Do you ever get used to living in this area? Oh goodness. No, I don't think you ever get used to it. That's the thing. I mean, you know it's happening and like I said, that's why I play it safe because you don't play around with Mother Nature. <laughs> The more I look at it, the circulation is going to be on top or just south of Perry right now. The news is that the, uh, there's a tornado down uh, no more than a mile from here. Then, as quickly as it came, the worst of the storm passes. A whole cluster of tornadoes has missed us by just half a mile. Everyone seems remarkably calm. This little uh, spontaneous community that's grown up, who they all uh, say goodbye to each other now and then try and make it uh, towards their destination, wherever they're going. It's over, thank God. You know, that's the great thing about Oklahomans is we really come together and we really unite and, and look out for one another, especially in a storm like that. Back on the road, I run into another supercell. Luckily, this one has no tornado warning attached. I think we've got hail. This seems the perfect opportunity to get out into the middle of a storm and experience my first giant hail. Yeah. Oh, God! Fucker! Bollocks! Yeah, this is a pea size. Yeah, they're coming in like bullets. I venture out again, this time with added protection. This is right in the thick of the core now. I soon realise whatever it is I'm experiencing, it's not hail. It packs a hell of a punch. It feels like thousands of tiny pins are piercing my skin at high velocity. A sudden gust blasts me, ripping my helmet off. That was an immense... Here comes the... What I'd experienced, I find out later, was atomized rain. Tiny wind-driven water droplets that only exist perilously close to a tornado. I'd been within a hair's breadth of a large tornado. But I know I'm going to have to get even closer. I'm back with the experts, and Dave's pinpointed central Kansas as today's tornado hotspot. You're approaching a twisting storm. Please exercise caution. Driving right under the belly of the storm, we're hit by massive hailstones. I've never seen this much hail on the roadway before. Dave, can I get out? Yeah, I can if you want. On with the American football pads again, but this time into real hail. Well, out in a hailstorm now like you have never seen. I think a big hail boat is getting off the baseball, baseball sides. Oh, God. 
experience indeed. This is beyond golf balls and they come down at a hell of a pace. I don't know what sort of speed they think. What sort of speed are they doing? Oh, they're falling over 100 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can believe that. You can understand how whole crops just been obliterated. Animals, it's not unusual. You can kill several cattle out of a herd. Wow, look at that. Measuring hail isn't just a bit of nerdy fun for Dave. All his information is relayed to the National Weather Service, where it's used to help in the research into supercells. That's nearly softball size. In the last hour, we've experienced high-speed winds, driving rain and giant hail three impressive examples of a supercell's arsenal. There's a big building on fire over here. Looks like and just down the road, we come across evidence of another of its unforgiving weapons. Can I ask you what happened here? Lightning strike. Lightning strike? Yeah. Is, is this your house? No, it's my neighbor's. Well, this is the human cost in storms. Hail, rain, thunder, lightning. Uh, these are unforgiving things. These are unforgiving things. Here we have a family who've lost all their possessions in one lightning strike. Just a few days ago, six people were killed here in Pitcher, Oklahoma. A hundred and twenty-six people have died in this year's tornado season, the worst for a decade. This is the town of Pitcher, or at least it was the town of Pitcher. Um, this was hit by a very significant tornado. It's very spooky walking through here. This is damage, this has just occurred. This gives you a very distinct impression of what it must have been like the day after in Greensburg. It is uh, hard to see the devastation, and it's hard to see because there's death here, and there's the sadness that hurts people's hearts, and it it makes us sad to think about it because our heart is uh, our heart's always in our home. Do you worry about living in this area? Uh, I want to start crying because if we start our house like this, we would uh, it would kill us. It's all right. I always say it can be beautiful one minute and then kill you the next. Just don't think it can't happen to you because it can. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever seen severe damage. It's horrible. These people, their whole lives have been destroyed, just taken away like that. And I know they look beautiful from afar and the storms are incredible, but after this trip, I've certainly got a new appreciation for what these storms can actually do. So I've been spending a lot of time now chasing after tornadoes, trying desperately to find one, to track one down, to step on its coattails. Um, and it's been incredibly difficult to do so. But as you know, for the people of Greensburg and the people here in Pitcher, clearly, they didn't want to see any tornadoes. They had no choice in the matter. The tornado found them. Maybe if I stop looking, the tornado will find me. That's the nature of tornadoes, it seems to me. Lord, we gather our hearts together tonight in memory of the ones we lost a year ago this evening. We know that you don't make mistakes. 
But Lord, forgive us for still asking why. I've returned to Greensburg. Today, they're remembering their dead, one year after the town was obliterated by one of America's biggest ever tornadoes. Greensburg still has a long way to go, but slowly houses are being rebuilt, this time with an added precaution. And we have a safe room just under our front porch here. This is for in case a bad storm, tornado. It's got cement walls, cement ceiling, some soup and some water and some blankets. And the door it opens inwards in case blocked. This is what they say is a safe room. The Bible tells us that trials and tribulations will strengthen our faith and we have went through a huge exercising of our faith and I think that faith has prevailed. Today, in my search for that elusive tornado, I've joined a group of weather tourists. Their guide, Roger, has seen over 400 twisters and today hopes to add to that number. Let's do it. Let's just do it. Let's go. It looks like the best of everything comes together. Three days into their tour, they've yet to see a tornado. But at last, the radar looks promising. I'm actually quite encouraged by what we're seeing. Pictures doesn't really do it any justice. You gotta be there in the moment, feeling the humidity blasting you in the face. And... It's, it's quite a spiritual experience. Isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Are severe weather events, you know, truly amoral, or is it an act of God trying to get one person that he doesn't want anymore off the planet or something? I don't know. It's kind of up there. Repeating. The National Weather Service in Tulsa has issued a tornado warning for Southern Haskell County, Northern Latimer County. I've spent weeks driving thousands of miles around the heartlands of America. Finally, it seems, I'm about to come face to face with my elusive prey. Oh my God, we have hit the Arkansas jackpot here. Beautiful, multiple vortex tornado. <laughs> it's swirling, it's twisting, wow. Not far, it's only a mile in front of us, people. That's, that's absolutely amazing, actually. That's amazing. What a, what a sight. A large and extremely dangerous tornado is on the ground. This is a life-threatening situation. If you are in the path of this tornado, take cover immediately. Say prayer for the people this thing comes in contact with. This is not a wimpy tornado. Minutes later, right in front of us, another tornado. Large stovepipe. Oh my God, look at it, it's huge. Debris all over the place. Good. Violent tornado. You're less than a quarter mile away. Oh, oh my God. It doesn't get any better than this, folks. It does not. For the weather tourists, this tornado was rich reward. Not so for others. This is my dog and my red dog. I was here alone and they were having to listen to it on the scanner. I'm okay. <laughs> I was fine. You're fine. Okay. Scared. Yeah, I've been pretty scary, huh? Yes. What did it sound like? Just a roaring. I thought the wind was picking up, and it was just a roaring sound. It got real calm just before, 
the wind picked up and it picked up all of a sudden and then I saw the barrel fly by. But it's amazing to see that everybody's gathered just to make sure everybody's yes. okay. Yeah, I mean, we're a close-knit community. We try to watch out for each other, you know. Everybody knows everybody and they've known everybody's family for years, you know. I told her the Lord was with her, don't forget it. Yeah. But anyway, driving through the, through the night um, and driving through yet more storms, the lightning's still flashing, the rain's still falling. So it doesn't let you forget this part of the world at this time of the year. It doesn't let you forget um, the awesome power of nature. Tomorrow, I will be back with Dave for my last day's chasing. He's promised to try and get me as close to the heart of a tornado as possible, hopefully without getting me killed. It's my final day's storm chasing. I've linked up with Dave Ewalt in Nebraska, where storms are brewing and chasers are massing. SPC probability tables um, have given a 70% risk for F2 to F5 tornadoes. F5 being the most powerful. Yeah. Uh, and 90% uh, tornado risk in general, which is on the extreme end. Hey, how do you feel? <laughs> I feel all tornado-y. <laughs> Dave is leading us straight towards a series of large supercells, using live radar to predict where any tornadoes might be. There's a tornado off to the south of the road. These buildings are having tornadoes in the, in the core over there. We've got a cone tornado uh, south of the road down there. All right, now we're in trouble. All right, this has got to be inside circulation here. As the tornado disappears from view, our pursuit is hampered by incredibly high winds. And in Paul's van, they see the first evidence of the tornado's force. Those carriages are just blown over there. I think we just moved out of it, though. Yeah, the uh, train's just been knocked over as well, Dave. Wow. Yeah, all the train's just gone over. That's that train right there laying over on its side. Go on up good when the wind allows you to. We're, we're going to be safe here. Tornado's been reported in Kearney with damage. <laughs> damage to the uh, garage there. Whoa. This looks like they probably had winds about 100 mile an hour coming through here. The roof's gone, look at that. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. With so many storms bumping into each other, it's become a dangerous day to be chasing tornadoes. This is becoming real messy. You're left with a lot of rain, just like what we have here, falling into it. That obscures, obscures the mesocyclone back in there. Makes it almost impossible to see any tornado features with the storm. With the rain concealing any potential tornadoes, we make a quick pit stop for petrol. Okay, Once again, um, I'm in a gas station and the a tornado warning has just been issued. So uh, now everybody's just taking shelter and waiting to see whether a tornado does come this way. What's going on there? Suddenly, the lights go out. Everybody in the gas station rushes to take refuge in the walk-in fridge. Hey, if I could have everybody go back there to the cooler part in the front. But Dave's confident the tornado is still some way off. I just hope he's right. There ain't no going south anymore. There ain't no going south anymore. We've barely left the forecourt when we're hit by ferocious winds. Suddenly, day turns to night. Instinctively, I open the door to film it. Instantly, there's a tremendous vacuum. I'm almost sucked out of the van. Hanging on for 
right. In the path for a massive win. He's practically lifting the whole van right off the ground. Just a few feet behind us, the British lads are still on the garage forecourt. Shit it out. Oh, just took a massive fucking side off. Fuck. Fuck, we are fucked. Dave, you receive it. Oh, the car's gone over there. The lorry's gone over. Dave, where are you? Now, now in trouble. Oh, shit. Oh, we've lost the back window as well. For the last six minutes, it's felt like we've been flying through the air. It's a great relief to everyone when the van finally settles back on all four wheels. <laughs> The most astonishing wind I've ever experienced. In fact, they lifted the R van right clear off its wheels and into got into, into, into the air. But look what's happened here. This awning has landed on this uh, car. Luckily, nobody in it. Are you okay? Yeah, our window blew out on this side. We're soaked and we have no windows, so we've, we're trying to call AAA. But we're alive. It's yeah, pretty exactly. scary. My car got picked up on two wheels, and luckily I didn't go over, man, but it was close. It was close. All the trailers over there turned over. It's a tanker over there sideways. There's three trailers over there laying on this side. We got the edge of the tornado, 160 miles an hour. If it was any stronger than that, we would have been in serious trouble there. Serious trouble. So are you saying that a tornado actually came through here? Yes. So what hit, what hit this gas station was a tornado? What hit this gas station was a tornado that was embedded in the rain. It was visible on radar, so we knew that it was existing. I just checked and I got to go live with the weather of channels. Course. Hi, this is Ken. Uh, it was an exhilarating and scary uh, experience, I have to say. The most exhilarating, perhaps one of the scariest moments that I've ever, ever been through. And I think I, I speak for all of us. But a lot of people uh, are being very lucky today. There's no doubt about it, apart from a few scratches here and there. Nobody has been badly hurt. Um, we just came very, very close. I've only just kind of realised now how close we came to perhaps a significant tornado and that... I'm never going to take those sorts of situations for granted again. A few hours later, Dave's had time to work out exactly what happened back at the gas station. It produced a significant tornado within a half mile north of us. That's nothing that I would have ever put us in if I thought that that was going to happen. But the storm looked very benign when we pulled into the gas station and there was about a 15 minute period there where we weren't looking at data, we weren't paying attention to anything that was going on. It just evolved so quick. You let your guard down like, like I did for a little bit, got burned by it, but that's what supercells do. They're, I've, I've always said, nothing good happens around them and we back that up tonight. Still in a state of, of shock, I think. And it's relentless. Here we have the uh, around the clock weather forecast, giving warning after warning after warning of flash floods, of tornadoes, of high winds. And the only thought I've got in my head right now is how come people live here? Because I mean, it's, it's fantastic to experience it as a tourist, but I can go home. I will never ever complain about the weather in my country, in Britain, ever again. Not after this.
Having seen tornadoes up close, it is indeed difficult not to think of them as vicious predators hunting their prey. Anybody living in this part of the world is fair game for a killer twister. If they're lucky, they'll get 20 minutes warning, like the town of Greensburg. Next time, I seek out perhaps the most violent, destructive, and deadly of all storms, the hurricane. Mother Nature is more powerful than any man-made bomb. More ferocious and destructive than any army. Every day, she claims more victims, showing no mercy and taking no prisoners. Fire's coming this way, Chris, and it's moving. I'm Chris Terrell. As a filmmaker and adventurer, I'm fascinated by extreme situations. I never use a film crew. I prefer to go it alone, just me and my camera. And now I want to confront nature head on, take my camera into her very jaws. Out in a hailstorm now like you have never seen. The thing's coming down at 100 miles an hour. Now that hurts. Ah! I want to meet the people who live in the path of killer natural forces. Oh, my God! Who choose to play Russian roulette with nature at her most trigger-happy. It can be beautiful one minute and then kill you the next. Just don't think it can't happen to you because it can. This time, I fear for my life when I come face to face with that most vicious and unforgiving of storms. The deadly firestorm. Well, this is Southern California, and for many, a sort of paradise on Earth. But this paradise can very quickly turn into a living hell. It's early autumn, 2008, the height of the fire season. And the indications are that it could be one of the worst on record. With the high winds, the low humidity, and of course the hot, hot temperatures, it's an extremely dangerous fiery condition, which is going to last throughout the weekend. 30 to 60 mile an hour winds with gusts up to 80 miles an hour are expected. A long, hot summer has turned Southern California into a powder keg. Wildfires are springing up everywhere, which, if left unchecked, could turn into raging firestorms. Forces of nature so powerful, they'll take out everything in their path. To get as close as possible to these unforgiving theories of nature, I've joined up with a team of firefighters. But these are no ordinary firefighters. Seatbelts, everybody. Safety first. Every one of these men is a convicted prisoner, serving as a frontline firefighter as an alternative to being locked up in jail. It's a remarkable scheme run by firefighting agency Cal Fire and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. A scheme that prepares these men for the most dangerous of work. We don't know the situation until we get there. It can be anything. It can start off from a little brush fire to a big forest fire. And that was when the whole crew pulls together and everybody works as one do what we do best, fight fires. 
<laughs> Gangsters, drug dealers, burglars and armed robbers. This is Crew 7, one of a number of such crews who fight alongside regular firefighters and nicknamed the good bad guys. That's the real thing, Chris. Since it's grass fire, grass fire, you don't really know what, what to expect because it just rolls and it just goes. Everything is thrown at the fire. Air attack crews drop retardant whilst the ground crews wade in. Seven, moving. You don't hesitate when it comes to wildfire, and there are always added complications and hidden dangers. To help prevent a massive explosion, Crew 7's task is to start back burn. Oh, help us hold the edge right here, spread out along the line, right here. Fighting fire with fire, burning vegetation in front of the main blaze to halt its advance, hopefully. It's just getting hotter and hotter. Intense heat uh, coming off this uh, dry, dry, very volatile, combustible vegetation. I can't tell you how hot it is right here. It's virtually unbearable. But if they don't stop it now, this fire could get quickly out of hand. You hear things popping in there. It's am old ammunition and spray cans. Oh, really? Yeah. That could be dangerous. Very dangerous, yeah. Go. You hear that? Yeah. Unexploded bullets, high pressure pipelines. Wildfires are never simple affairs. But today, thankfully, the winds have dropped, and so the fire is soon contained. Just a couple of hundred acres, tiny by Californian standards. It could have been an awful lot worse. The scene that's been left behind is nothing short of apocalyptic. Quite otherworldly. I can't even imagine what the fire any bigger than this would feel like. The fires that they can get here are, can be thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. First fire. Good little start for us. Yeah. This is a small one, but we're going to go to some good ones. Yeah. No one's in any doubt. This will not be the last fire of the season, nor the biggest. California is set ready to explode. Oak Glen Camp, home to the good bad guys one of 39 such camps statewide that house 4,300 inmates, trained to respond to all manner of emergencies like floods and search and rescue, but mostly wildfire. Here, the prisoners, divided into crews of about 14 men strong, serve their time, some for months, others for years. It's not so bad, you know? We got our TV room over here, and, and we got, uh, got the Little weight set up in the back. Got a nice chow hall. Food's pretty good. Yeah. It's not, it, you know, it, it's not home, but yeah. it is home. You know, it'll do till we get out. Yeah. So, you know, I can't complain. Okay. Sure beats behind the wall, you know. These men, incarcerated as they are, have learned the importance of working together and looking out for each other. We're all accountable, not only for ourselves, but for our crew members. You know, we all go in there, you know, 14, 15, depending on how many on the crew, and we all got to come out together, you know, because we, we built that type of, uh, that bond together, you know. It's a brotherhood type thing. It's better late than never, you know, that you get these type of things instilled within you, you know, and these things can carry you a long ways. Being a part of this is a real dedication. I mean, you know, you have to work at it. And you just can't think you can just jump in it and do it. You gotta learn how to do it and progress at it. And that's um that's where we're at. That's where we're at. Oak Glen is unlike any prison I've ever seen. Rubbing shoulders with nature in all its guises, 
It's located right in the heart of Southern California's wildfire country. Here, the densely forested mountains are intersected by densely populated valleys that act as funnels for strong, hot desert winds called the Santa Anas that blow every autumn when the atmosphere can be extremely unstable. In other words, right now. Now these winds, on the one hand, of course, can be harnessed, as with this wind farm behind me. But on the other hand, they can cause incredible damage. Not because of the winds themselves, but because of what they can do in association with heat and fire. Because the wind as I film myself in this sun. searingly hot valley, talking about the dangers of heat, wind and fire, I fail to see what's happening to my car. Oh my God. Spontaneously, the car, it just caught on fire. That's the nature of these sorts of temperatures. Luckily, the wind isn't blowing too hard. If it was, we'd be in real trouble now, because this, uh, this is gonna go any second. Here I am trying to cover spontaneous wildfires in the desert and uh, my own car explodes in this heat in these very unf unforgiving conditions. There goes the car. Right extraordinary. I I'm almost, almost lost for words, to be honest. A cloud of acrid black smoke spiralling into the sky is the best mayday call possible. With the fire service on high alert, they're on the scene within minutes. I have no idea why the car burst into flames, but the fire service, it seems, sees this all the time. The fire um, started from underneath the automobile, and it's very common for the catalytic converter to ignite the brush. And in fact, it's very common for vegetation and fires in Southern California to start that way, whether the car stalls, it's out of gas or something, especially during the summertime when it's very dry, the catalytic converter, which gets extremely hot, will ignite the brush underneath there and, uh, you know, it's the rest is history. We're very fortunate right now, we're in the desert and the vegetation is relatively sparse. Had we been in an area where there's higher densities of vegetation, we'd still be fighting fire. But uh, I think the best thing is we're fortunate that you're safe and that the vehicle, you know, you've lost the vehicle, maybe a couple bushes burnt and that's all that's happened and we can be thankful that very, very minimal. Thanks for coming to my rescue. <laughs> I won't do it again. <laughs> promise? I promise. <laughs> okay. All right. It's easy to laugh after the event. No injury and nothing but a spare camera lost. But as I drive back on the fire tender, I wonder if this is a sign of things to come. With temperatures rising, humidity now in single figures and strengthening winds, wildfire outbreaks are virtually certain. Back at Oak Glen, the men on red alert know it's just a matter of time before they get the call. But for me to work alongside them when that call comes and follow them into raging firestorms, I first have to earn my place and prove my worth. And the door to Crew 7, I'm told, is 150 feet above me. OK, so today is my uh, initiation into Crew 7, and uh, that initiation will consist of me climbing this monstrous tree that uh, they, they, they pride themselves on their ability to climb trees, so there's no way out of this. I've got to climb that tree if I want to be a member of Crew 7. Tree climbing is vital to firefighters, as they may well need to cut away vegetation to deprive fire of fuel. So this is a technique I have to master, as well as a test I have to pass. See the, the bottom branch, the uh -huh. first branch hanging out, it's like way up there. 
Okay. You gotta touch that. You get up there, touch it, and then just lean back like that. That's what everybody told me. I do what? Just lean back. <laughs> and when you've done That's that, it. you can call yourself Crew 7. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crew 7. <laughs> <laughs> this is a challenge that I have been told will cost me much of the skin on my hands and shins, but I have to give it my best shot. You know, if you fall off the street, you get to stay a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> is this going to come on? It seems like a fair deal for the trust I've gained from Crew 7 and their complete openness with me. Captain, you ready to go up? Ready. Come on. He's ready to go, Chris. Okay. There's really only one way to try to make an amends for your wrongs is to try to give back. For me, it's weird because all of my prison uh, priors have been burglaries. So for me to have an opportunity to actually contribute to saving someone's home or saving someone's business, it's really like, you know, it's really real kinky, you know? Yeah, and it works like that. It's you quite know? ironic, because yeah, you, you really could be is. saving a property that in a right. former in a former time you might have burgled. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah, being totally honest, yeah, yeah, you know, so it's, it's just weird how it works out, you know? Yeah. But it's really gratifying for me, you know, yeah. as an individual and knowing my history, yeah. to be able to do something to give back, you know? It really feels good, you know? You, want, you don't want to be like this, you want to stand up. This program of firefighting in, in prison, you know, this gave me a, a great sense of being that, you know what, I don't have to be that low-life drug addict. And if I can do this in here, I can do something great out there. What do you think your chances are, Steve, of staying out of prison? My chances are... are like 60-40. For or against? Against. Mm -hmm. 60, I, I won't make it, and 40%, then I will. You got it, Chris. You know, to survive in, in society, with society's rules and stuff, you know, you have to go to work, and you have to learn how to budget yourself. And you get lost, and you figure that it's easier to come back to prison, you know, because they take care of you. How much of your life have you spent in prison, Steve? Right now, about 25 years of it. And how old are you? I'm 46. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> no, no, Chris, the other way. You got to let something out, because as you come there, there you yeah, go. that's good, that's good. Right. That's good. All right. All right, there you go. Being his first time, still like a profession. Hey, you ain't up there yet! <laughs> Come on, Chris! It's right there. That's right, Chris. Hard it out. There. Right there, baby. You're almost there, Chris. A little bit more. All right, guys. Sorry. <laughs> That was a great seven. Good job, Chris. Thanks very much. Well, <laughs> welcome to a seven, Chris. <laughs> welcome to a seven. Congrats, Big C. All right, Chris. Good job, Chris. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Good job. All right. Welcome to a seven. Thank you. Good job, OG. Thanks very much. Good job, Chris. Welcome to a seven. Thank you. From this moment, I'm accepted as part of the crew. But climbing the Redwood is just the beginning. I am now put through my paces to get me fire ready. That's a break. You want to pull that back? You got to put three cuts. One from the bottom, two from the top. There are specialized techniques to learn, off the ground and on the ground. What to do if fire gets the upper hand? Just last year, five firefighters perished in the flames. Throughout Southern California, small wildfires are breaking out, vegetation combusting. 
As fast as one is put out, another erupts. Nature is gaining the upper hand. And then it happens. Reports come through of a huge fire threatening a town just 50 miles from the prison camp at Oak Glen. Good morning, I'm Elaine Perkins along with Maggie McKay. We've had a breaking news situation starting at about 10.30 last night. It's a wow. wildfire burning out of control in Silmar. We have 1,500 acres um, that have burned so far. Windy conditions, oh, that orange glow in the sky signifies what I um, would imagine must be a mighty fire. Frustratingly, though, Crew 7 haven't been called out yet because it's just outside of their jurisdiction. So um, I'm going to check it out alone. I must say I'd feel a lot happier if I had Crew 7 with me, but um, this could be my last chance to see a really big wildfire up close and personal. Wow. Right now, there's a, there's a strong wind blowing, I should think, it's about 50 to 60 miles an hour. This will drive the fire. Uh, onwards and nothing can stop it if it, if it continues to come in this direction but it, the wind's changing all the time as well so it's very difficult to predict exactly where the fire might end up. The firefighters are in position with their hoses. With the fire. Los Angeles, the yeah, there's the police now telling everybody to get out of here because once this fire comes over that ridge there's nothing can stop it. It's going to take these houses out. All Foothill residents Mandatory evacuation. Please evacuate the area. All foothill residents, please evacuate the area. Just helping the neighbors out. We're already packed. You're used to this sort of thing, are you? Um, it's happened a few times. It happened like a month ago. Yeah. But it was not nearly as close as it is now. Right. So this this is a lot more scary. Yeah. This, this is serious business. Yeah. Well, good luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right now, we're waiting for it to blow over this ridge right here. Hopefully it won't come over that ridge, but right now it looks like it's going to come over the ridge and then it's going to, the way the wind's blowing, it's going to blow it south of here. Right. So hopefully we, we're going to protect all these homes all the way down to the bottom of the hill. Right. And once it blows past there, we're going to pick everything up and then we're going to go on the other side of the freeway. Right, that's so that's about much. it. Good luck. Right. The latest briefing showed just how big of a mess this one is. Flames are said to be moving in anywhere from one half to one mile per hour. Prompting a warning now from L.A. County Assistant Fire Chief John Tripp. Our number one priority right now is life, and people have to get out of the path of the fire. We're trying to get people out of harm's way. The fire soon reaches us, and it just keeps coming. By now, 20,000 people have been evacuated as 70 mile per hour winds drive the flames relentlessly forward. The fire is raging, it's moving really fast. You can get us some sense of the speed at which this fire is progressing through the undergrowth. I can't say how much longer, it's getting mighty hot. I go in shoulder to shoulder with the firefighters, but as the flames lick at my feet, I pray my camera doesn't melt in the searing heat. It's an immense blaze. There it comes. It's taking the trees, the vegetation, so friable, so dry, so combustible and volatile. You see that? The whole tree going up. There's a house right to the side of the tree. The firemen now, the firefighters are trying to douse it with uh, water now to try and stop the fire getting to it, but I don't think they're going to do it. The embers are coming in. Ah, oh, I can't see with the smoke. The smoke. Ah. Oh. <sighs> this is extraordinary. It's a surreal experience. Stinging, piercing embers are blowing everywhere, some settling under the eaves of buildings, invisibly igniting the underside of roofs. The shop in front of me now. Oh, ah, the shop in front of me now has had it. It's going to go. They can't save it. 
There's no way they can save it. Absolutely choking. It's like swallowing glass. Ah. Ah. With the fire all around us, I make my way into the back garden of one house under threat. There, staying close to the swimming pool, a trembling refugee from the raging flames. Oh, there, the wild coyote seeking refuge by a swimming pool is probably in shock, maybe a little bit singed, but at least he's alive. When I uh, heard a splash in the pool, I turned around and the coyote had jumped into the pool. Oh, it's a, quite, a, quite, a, quite an intelligent oh, coyote. <laughs> to battle what is now a 2,600-acre wildfire. It's moved equipment and personnel westward ahead of the flames. The situation right now is very fluid. They can't even get an accurate count on the structures lost. The guesstimates right now hover around 10 homes damaged or destroyed. Putting live from the command post. Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. If you had seen it myself, I wouldn't have believed that fire could be this ferocious and this relentless. It's been a long night, and as dawn breaks, we know that 500 homes have been lost in the Silma fire. As I make my way back to Oak Glen, the reports continue to come through of fires erupting all over Southern California. Massive wildfires, many spreading towards built-up areas, including one clearly visible from the prison camp itself. Crew 7 have just been called. They're getting ready to go out, go through the gates. There are five fires burning in California today. California truly is burning. and uh, We're heading for one of them. Um, about 45 minutes away, so the guys are, are revved up. They're, they're very eager to get into action, put their training into to some purpose. But of course, there's always a slight nervousness because this is dangerous work. This is real fire. Are you ready, Chris? I'm ready. But being prisoners, fire means temporary liberation, so spirits are high. <laughs> <laughs> Up, Chris. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Been up all night at the sound of fire. Been there all night, huh? Yeah. Jeez, dude. Oh, no, it's about time. I'm looking for some hey, action. I'm trying to get dirty like you. <laughs> how you guys doing? All right. How you feeling? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm ready to go again. A little around the edges, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, you know, we'll deal with that later, huh? <laughs> <laughs> What's this, huh? It's over there. You got to put them on already? That's all right. You're going to get a piece of the action today. You yeah. got the hills up there? Yeah. There is? I think so. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> We're going to a fire in uh, Corona. We don't know how big it is. The last that we heard was about 100 acres plus, and they're losing some homes. Crew 7 and Crew 1 are striked up together, so uh, both crews are going. Get some action today, Chris. Yeah. We're going to get some action, baby. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pumped. I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Yeah, I'm pumped. I'm ready. <laughs> Adrenaline's already flowing. <laughs> no one. Is this your light? Yeah. Get like that. Is this your jacket too? Yep. Ah. It's chaos. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's chaos. You know what I mean? Everybody's heart do, 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 pounding, ready. You know what I mean? Ready for some action. Yeah. You forget where you leave your count bag, your shirt, whatever you know. <laughs> Remember, Santa Ana conditions, stay tight. No falling behind. Safety is everybody's job. We don't know what we got. We're going to figure it out when we get there. Stay safe, man. Yeah, hydrate. Buckle up. Go get it, Gat. Hey, get out throwing camel pack right there. But you, you're excited? Yeah, 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 I'm excited, you know what I mean? I've been watching since uh, the summer, the summer for this morning, yeah. the news and this fire, this fire, I was like, man, we're, let's go, you know what I mean? Let's, let's get on the CCV and let's go, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We finally got our wish, so we'll see what we're up for. 
<laughs> See, Chris, this is when the femininity comes out in men. You know what I mean? It's relax. Relax. It's just a little fire, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know. Worse than females. <laughs> Worse. Yeah, I said it. Who said you're first out of county, man? We're going to go right in the middle of it. Your eyes are going to be watered, Chris. It's going to be an all-nighter, will it? It looks like more than an all-nighter. It looks like we're going to go for a 24-hour shift here. You know? But we've been waiting for this, so this is what we're here for. You're amazed, I'm impressed. Yeah. It's, you know, it's amazing to see this stuff, but it's tragedy. So the people are losing their homes. Hey Chris, another house on the right. Right here. This is Yorba Linda, an affluent suburban town of some 70,000 people. But up to 40,000 are being evacuated in the face of a massive wind-driven wildfire that has already burned thousands of acres. Hundreds of residences are now under serious threat. The guy has been tasked to protect structures, so we've already seen quite a lot of houses uh, burning out, lost causes, but they're going to try and protect the houses that are still standing from the uh, oncoming fire. So it's quite a task. Drought's done, goggles up. Look it up, guys. This is a firestorm, man. This is good. This is as big as it's getting. This is crazy. This is really crazy. Uh, watch your back, Chris. Watch your back. Yeah. This raging wildfire is spreading fast. Some houses are already lost. Others now depend for their survival on an army of professional firefighters, supported by inmate crews like Crew 7. But will their training be enough in the face of this, one of nature's greatest furies? Crew 7 is going to be a long and dangerous fight. We've now three. The training's kicking in. The guys are now doing this for real. This fire is impinging on this house. They're taking up the branches just as they have done in training many times. And it's hot. It's really hot. These guys might have done wrong in the past, but they're certainly paying their debt to society now. So all these houses are under threat. They're all being threatened by the fire. So the uh, Crew 7 are now moving from one to the other as fast as they can to prevent the uh, fire encroaching any more than it has done already. But it only takes a spark and it takes an ember and the, uh, the game is lost.
one house plus seven are not going to save. And of course, this is what they're trying to protect the other houses from. Because uh, once these fires take hold, this is what happens. It's a big tragedy. A house is a house that can be replaced, but the belongings on the inside can't, the memories. That's what's the hardening part about this. Mm -hmm. One day the kids are out here playing tetherball. Now they're coming home to everything lost. Yeah. Late into the night, and the wind-driven fire is not to be tamed. It's spreading fast, engulfing thousands of acres of forest and grassland. The town is still in great danger. Crew 7, after 14 hours on the front line, continue to fight the flames hand to hand. They must remove vegetation to starve the fire. So the wind keeps gusting and changing direction. So the fire's going this way and that way, and it tries to trip you up. You never know quite where you are with fire. The guys are working right up against the front line of the fire. It's incredibly... You can hardly catch your breath. You have to be careful. Hey, get out of there! Let it go down, we'll get back in there. Chris, get out of there. Yeah. We gotta get zip right through here. No, I got the rear, man. The fire at the bottom of this canyon is now so immense that it's actually creating its own weather, its own winds. It is in effect fanning itself. It's turned into a gigantic firestorm, a very rare event and one of nature's most terrifying party tricks. These could just be the dancing flames in a coal fire, but in fact, what I'm filming from the top of a hill some two miles away is a spinning tornado of fire, hundreds of feet high. And the surrounding flames are no minnows either. I'd be willing to bet the flames are over a thousand feet. You can see them going up the one ridge over there, they're probably a thousand plus. Best way described, it looked like uh, someone opened a dam and a bunch of water came out, but instead of water, it was the fire. Yeah. Pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable. The flames climb the valley sides towards us, feeding on everything in their path. Forest, grassland, multi-million dollar houses. Crew 7 have only minutes to cut vegetation before the flames reach us a last-ditch attempt to stop the fire in its tracks. What we're doing right now, we're doing a 20-foot line cut so we can save these structures that are in back of us so we won't jump it. Right. Fire's coming this way, Chris, and it's moving. It's going to be up here in 10 minutes. Look how quick it's running. It hit some heavy fuel. It's just taking off. Yeah. Yeah. We got a pretty good wind on this right now. It's gonna do its thing. It's gonna consume whatever's in its path. So now you can see that that thing is uh, it's just basically. Uh, the flames reach us, hurling their embers upwards. Crew seven have done all they can to reduce the vegetation, but is it enough? All they can do now is keep watch and hope. See how that wind is feeding the fire? Yeah. Just feeding it. <laughs> The fire does its best to leap the fence, jump the path and advance. But thanks to Crew 7, it runs out of fuel. 
the houses are safe. At least in this part of town. We want to thank you, God, that there was no loss of life. We want to thank you that we have an opportunity to gather together like this as uh, friends and family and, and people who, uh, who know that there is a God and believe that, um, that, God, you can take the ashes and you can really make gold out of it. And we just pray for this family that we can be their support and their strength through these times. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Hey, man, I'm sorry. Fire doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter uh, what your property is. It doesn't matter who you are. It goes where it wants to go and it does what it wants to do. Some people say we control it, we contain it. It's a living, breathing uh, animal that it doesn't care where it goes or what it does. All it wants to do is burn. Fire eventually will go out. But unfortunately, the damage is already done here to numerous families that have been displaced now, whose lives have been uprooted and have to be uh, have to start all over again. It is sobering to me that the cause of this fire was the catalytic converter of a car. Mercifully, although 14 firefighters were injured, no one has been killed. But over 30,000 acres of wildland have been destroyed, and over 300 houses and businesses have been lost. But this house, at the head of a burnt-out canyon, was the first one Crew 7 went in to save. When I went back to see the house, I told the owner all about Crew 7, and she insisted she wanted to meet them. I keep thinking, what am I going to say to these young men who have saved my house? Thank you. Doesn't seem to be enough, but I, I think it says it all. Yeah. And I know I'm going to get emotional. what it's all about, yeah. you know? Here to protect people's homes, you know? This is Captain Dave Graywall Hi, and the Dave. firefighters it's that so were here to save your home. You. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. I want to meet every one of you. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Deborah. What's your name? Nick. Nick, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. Hello, ma'am. I'm Deborah. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, Gilbert. Gilbert. Thank you so much. So much. Hi. Hey, Big Al. Mm -hmm. Nathan. Nathan. Yes, Lord. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. Thank you. We appreciate Lawrence. it. Lawrence. Oh, I want to hear what each of you did. Hi. Hi. I'm Deborah. Hi, Deborah. I'm Sherman. Sherman, thank you You're for welcome. saving my house. Deborah, it's our Steve. pleasure. Steve, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Ernie. Ernie! Okay, you think? You're welcome. Just 12 hours ago, the wildfire was on Deborah's doorstep. But so were Crew 7. Steve, hi. Thank you so much. That's why we had to start raising them up and uh, cut some of the branches off of it. One. I know this is a huge community service you guys performed. You've helped, and I hope that spirit will stay with you of giving. And 
I, I thought, what would I say to all of you besides thank you? And thank you such a small little word, but I hope it says it all. I'm so grateful. I am so grateful to all of you. And please go on and do good things with your lives. I hope this, this will help you and inspire you. You made a difference. You've made a difference. And I'm, I'm so sincere, you can tell. And, and, um, I appreciate it. Hey, guys. The men of Crew 7, in fighting one of nature's most deadly furies, have touched a community and have themselves been touched in return. What will happen to these prisoners on release is very much up to them. They might face a rocky road, but maybe, just maybe, Fighting fire has provided a glimpse of life as it could have been, and still could be. Nature and her furies affect people in many different ways.